Thank you very much. I'm truly honored to be with you today. I know that this is a little bit difficult for us to have a session at a distance, but hopefully we can simulate a little bit of flow and engagement, even though I'm quite a few thousand miles away from you this morning. Actually, it's your evening, I guess. So let me begin with the presentation. If you were just to listen to the techno optimists, you would think that we were on a highway to heaven on earth and the self-driving buses are speeding up at an exponential rate. On the other hand, should you just listen to the techno pessimists, we are clearly going directly to hell in a handbasket. But most of us perceive technology as a source of both promise and productivity. And yet there's considerable disquiet, disquiet about specific areas of research and disquiet about the overall trajectory of scientific discovery and technological innovation. The self-driving car perhaps gives us an apt metaphor. Technology is moving into the driver's seat as a primary determinant of humanity's future. There is even the rather melodramatic possibility that we are inventing the human species as we have known it out of existence. In this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about AI ethics and then turn to some of the principles and issues that arise. And after which I'll talk about attempts to implement values directly into the systems we engineer and then I will finish up with a little bit of discussion about AI governance. AI ethics is of course about constraints, of course about limiting the likelihood of technologies that are unsafe or pose risks, but it's also about navigating uncertainties and in the uncertainties of a world we are creating that we don't even really know what it will be or what the technologies will be available in the near future. It's about trade-offs, about implementing some, some decisions, some courses of action that may actually have mitigating factors. And then there's the principles that we hear quite a bit about and the challenges of implementing those principles. Furthermore, ethics is also about maximizing the good, adapting the technologies for ways in which it will work for all. And finally, it's about engineering, about methods for implementing values and morals into the actual technologies that we are implementing. My colleague, Yi Zheng from the Chinese Academy of Science, he, he deduced that there are roughly 80 to 90 documents that have lists of values that should be implemented in AI and, and discuss those lists or can be reduced to lists. And he did this scatter chart, this, this uh, text chart of the incidences of various words and he surrounded it around the Chinese character for optimizing symbiosis. Because the simple fact is that we are not just dealing with individual values, but we're dealing with socio-technical systems and these values are going to need to work together. You hear a great deal about specific principles that are underscored when we talk about implementing AI systems. Particularly, you hear about the need for privacy, the need for accountability so that if systems fail, it's clear who will be held responsible and potentially culpable and liable. There's a tremendous amount of discussion about bias and fairness, particularly because we know that machine learning algorithms will reflect in their output the biases in the data, which is their input. And the data we are building on is is historical data often, and it has implicit biases built into it. And then there's concerns around transparency. Machine learning algorithms take in data and they give an output, but we have little idea how they go from input to output. And there's perhaps going to be a need in many situations, particularly should a system fail, 
to understand how it went from the input to the output and gave us such um, an unreliable or dangerous course of action. There are countless issues. There is behavior and attitude manipulation by marketing firms and by, by politicians. There's concerns around the use of data for surveillance in ways that will limit our freedom of expression. There's technological unemployment. There's existential risk that somewhat futurists are concerned that future forms of artificial intelligence will have super intelligence. That means they will be much smarter than the average human. And if they are not aligned with human values, they may pose risks to the continuation of our species. And finally, there are lethal autonomous weapons. West Weapon systems that can select their own targets and destroy with little or no human involvement. Technological unemployment is a term that was first coined by John Maynard Keynes in 1930. And with that term, he hoped to represent the long standing Luddite fear that each new technology was going to rob more jobs than it created. That concern has been ongoing for 200 years and we hear it over and over again every time new innovations are put forward. But for 200 years, this actually hasn't occurred that the technologies tend to create more jobs than they actually rob. But many of us, and I'm included, think it's different this time with the advent of AI systems that can replace cognitive work and not just manual labor. When we talk about autonomous systems, systems able to function with little or no human involvement, much of the attention has been upon lethal autonomous weapons and upon self-driving cars. And these certainly are harbingers of what to come and they've given us a lot of opportunity to think through some of the challenges of autonomy. But much of what autonomy affords us is hidden below the surface and will be witnessed in software that is taking actions with little direct evidence of their action the way you would have evidence of a self-driving car. So we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. And the broader challenge is that autonomous systems threaten to undermine the foundational principle that there is a human or corporate agent who is responsible and potentially culpable and liable for any harms that might occur. Value-added design is one of the two approaches that we're going to discuss for implementing values within to the technologies themselves. So consider that an engineer has a variety of design specifications, including design specifications specifically about ensuring the safety of a system, uh, such as making sure that servos don't overheat and start fires, or at least cause failures in the systems. It has been proposed that we make values among the design specifications that the engineers are given. So it could be specified that it is their challenge to enhance privacy in the systems they design and to determine upfront who will be held accountable and liable should the systems fail. Now these design specifications may direct them to very different platforms. For example, a platform in which their corporation is not going to be held liable for a failed system. Now I'm often identified with mapping a new field of inquiry which I did together with my colleague, Professor Colin Allen, who is now actually at the University of Pittsburgh. He and I wrote the book, Moral Machines Teaching Robots Right from Wrong Together. And in actual fact, this book has been in publication for over a decade now, but it's still highly cited. In Moral Machines, we outline this new field of inquiry, which is sometimes called machine morality or machine ethics, 
computational ethics, artificial morality, friendly AI, and more recently, the AI researchers have been putting forward the term value alignment, that the systems that they create with artificial intelligence, that their values are aligned with human values. This new field of inquiry is largely directed at creating artificial moral agents. And it's been necessitated by the implementation of moral decision-making faculties in artificial agents, and also necessitated by autonomous systems making choices, taking actions that can affect humans for good or for bad. The godmother of affective computing, Rosalind Picard, put it well when she said, that the greater the freedom of a machine, the more it will need moral standards. There are a series of questions which, which inform this area of research. First of all, do we need artificial moral agents making moral decisions? When? For what? <clears throat> do we want computers making ethical decisions? The age-old question, whose morality or what morality? Do we want to implement the Ten Commandments, Kant's categorical imperative, utilitarianism, yama and niyama? There are so many different choices. And finally, how can we make ethics computable? This graph might help you get a better understanding of what we're dealing with. On the horizontal axis, we have sensitivity going to a high degree of ethical sensitivity. And on the vertical axis, we have autonomy. In theory, you could fit any technology into this graph. So in the lower left-hand corner, you could put a hammer. A hammer has no sensitivity and it has no autonomy. But just to the northeast of that camera, you might place a thermostat. A thermostat has sensitivity to temperature changes and can turn on or off air conditioning or heating as needed. The computers, the robots and software bots that we're implementing today, they are largely operationally moral, which means they implement values which have been more or less hardwired into the systems by the engineers and specified by the corporations or research labs for whom they work. But we are moving into a realm where the engineers, and this is particularly true with machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence more generally, where the engineers cannot always know how the system will respond with new inputs or in new environments. So they are gonna need some form of functional morality. They are gonna need ways in which they process moral algorithms which help discern the appropriate course of action among the choices available. Now, everybody also wants to talk about full moral agency. That's the future when machines really can be held responsible for their actions. In spite of all that, all the hype, I would say that's a very distant prospect. And particularly when you think about put, building moral intelligence into computer systems, you can realize how distant it will be in spite of the fact that the computer systems we have today are smarter than humans in certain respects. My colleague, Roman Yampolsky, a computer scientist, put it well when he said, those who say that AI ethics is hard are unreasonably optimistic. Now our challenges don't only lie with digital technology and artificial intelligence, they lie with all the emerging fields of research within biotechnology, within nanotechnology, within other fields. So let me quickly just mention two examples. One is within synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is a field where we take, we take genomics and we engineer either new biological pro products 
or even new organisms. So one example of a, of a desirable form of synthetic biology would be the creation of a mosquito that was incapable of carrying malaria or yellow fever. We already have the capacity to do so. We can alter the genes to do so. And furthermore, we can build in what are called gene drives that will facilitate that new species quickly, quickly eliminating the older version of the species that did not create the, these, that did not carry these features. In the area of eliminating malaria, this would clearly be a great benefit for humanity. But consider also that, that synthetic biology and gene drives can be used to create frivolous species or create versions of species that would actually undermine ecosystems. In the long run, synthetic biology could potentially do more harm than good. Geoengineering is a field where we use technology to mitigate the effects of global climate change. For example, spewing sulfates into the, the stratosphere, in, in effect creating the equivalent of a volcanic explosion where you have a heavy layer of sulfates that reflects sunlight away from the earth, slowing down global climate change. Now this could be quite beneficial, but we actually have no idea what the overall effect of deploying such a technology could be and whether the deployment, <clears throat> excuse me for a moment, <clears throat> and whether the deployment of such a technology could have effects that were more disastrous than the climate change it was meant to mitigate. All of this indicates the need for governance of the emerging technologies. But we have a rather delicate situation in that the speed of scientific discovery and technological innovations far out, outpaces our ability to implement ethical legal oversight. In fact, there's a fundamental mismatch between the two, what is sometimes referred to as a pacing problem. Professor Gary Marchant from the Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law at Arizona State University and I were lamenting this fact one day when we altered our conversation 180 degrees and we started to think about what kinds of 21st century approaches to governance should we be putting in place for emerging technologies? How could we for forge agile and adaptive ethical legal oversight. And we came up with a new proposal that we called governance coordinating committees, which would function as issues managers. They would coordinate the activities of the various stakeholders. They would engage in comprehensive monitoring of, of a field of research, flagging issues and gaps that were not being attended to by industry or by other approaches to governance they would find a solution within the robust set of available mechanisms. And they would be mandated to avoid regulation where possible, favoring soft governance. Now soft governance may be a new term for some of you. It refers to standards, professional codes of conduct, laboratory, laboratory practices and procedures, insurance policies means other than hard law to regulate technologies. Now, soft governance does have an advantage. It's much more adaptive. It can, it can be put in place quickly. It can be dismantled quickly when it's no longer needed. But it also does have a disadvantage, which is it seldom has any form of, any form of uh, ensuring of enforcement, of ensuring that people follow through on the guidelines. Nevertheless, this is approach for credible and trustworthy 21st century governance. Now, any new governance mechanism has its implementation challenges. From where would it get its authority, its legitimacy? Would it have adequate influence? How would the members and administrators be chosen? How would it establish its credibility? Should it be governmental or private or some combination of two? 
from whom would the Governance Coordinating Committee get its funding? And to who would it be accountable? All of these implementation challenges raise questions of whether this kind of approach is just too complicated. Or perhaps it's hopelessly naive. It may even be both too complicated and hopelessly naive. Nevertheless, we've met complex challenges before and something like this is needed, even if it isn't our proposal for a governance coordinating committee. Now I've been engaged in taking the lead responsibility for convening an international Congress for the governance of artificial intelligence. It was to have occurred in Prague last April, but because of the COVID crisis, we were forced to postpone it until May 13th through 15th, 2021. And I hope that we will see some of you there in Prague, presuming we're all able to travel by then. The direction of the Congress is to go beyond principles and individual policy measures to focus on first steps toward putting in place international mechanisms for the governance of AI. And one of the expert committees that has met in advance of this Congress has already proposed that we put forward something like the Global Governance Committee, which they're calling a global governance network for AI, a first step toward a global governance committee. I'd be remiss though, if I did not speak for a moment about the COVID-19 crisis and how it has changed the environment in which we are all operating. Most specifically, it has sped up existing trends and therefore making it even more challenging to put in place appropriate governance mechanisms. For example, we need contract tracing in order to slow the propagation of the virus. And yet contract tracing in many societies becomes a first step to what might eventually be government surveillance that could hamper freedom of expression. The COVID crisis has underscored inequalities. I imagine that most of you on, on this presentation with me at the Media Rumble, you come from the middle and upper classes within India. So you are in the position to engage with social distancing. You are not living in cramped quarters together where the spread of the virus is likely to pick up dramatically. And we are already seeing that happen tragically throughout India. But AI solutions may mitigate some of the inequalities that have been underscored but it could also exacerbate structural inequalities, particularly in the form of technological un unemployment, which could devastate some of the work that, that has been um, done in Africa, in, uh, in China, in India, in other large population centers. Another area in which COVID-19 crisis has altered the landscape is by speeding up online shopping, communication, and meetings and work such as this. In effect, we are empowering the digital AI oligopoly much more quickly. And that oligopoly is already significantly more powerful than the oil industry ever was. So we are in an environment where technological development is truly accelerating. Its deployment is truly accelerating. And therefore the need for foresight and planning becomes pressing. Thank you ever so much. Uh, so Wendell, um, I don't know whether you saw this article on the 8th of September uh, in The Guardian, which was written by a robot. It is titled, a robot wrote this entire article, are you scared yet, human question mark? It starts off with, I am not a human, I'm a robot. A thinking robot, I use only 0.12% of my cognitive capacity. I'm a micro robot in that aspect. I know that my brain is not a feeling brain, but it is capable of making rational, logical decisions. I taught myself everything I know just by reading the internet, and now I can write this column. My brain is boiling with ideas. 
And then this article goes on to argue that we as a species have nothing to fear from this robot who is writing this article. Um, journalism is something that negotiates AI in various ways, and we shall try to cover much of that. But when I read articles like this, or I'm sure you've read those poems that have gone around that this poem was written by a robot. How realistic is it to assume that one day news will be more dependent on AI than on actual reporters who are reporting information? Well, as you know, we are already seeing that. It's not just this article. There actually are news stories being put out there that conglomerate information that has been acquired on the web in other forms. And uh, like this robot, they can be very good in putting together related information but they often come up with non sequiturs, very confusing relationships that are presumed. Because the simple fact is that these systems do not have semantic understanding. They're engaged in a syntactical process, um, a process where they, they go through putting together symbols that seem similar or seem related based on the deduction deductive procedures they can go through. But climbing over that, what shall I say, that hurdle to get to consciousness and semantic understanding, that lies in the distant future. Now, how distant, there's a great deal of debate. I'm one of the people who's a bit more skeptical about when we will see that. But uh, I certainly have colleagues who think it could happen within the next 10 to 20 years. And there are people like Lake Ray Kurzweil who even have quicker timelines. So what does this mean for your media folks who are, who are with us? Well, it, me it probably points to the fact that you're going to have to parse out meanings that cannot be just structurally put together or information that cannot be just structurally put together and that has a real interpretive nuance in regards to the information you're putting together that looks for ways to convey subtleties in terms of the implication of the information and not merely putting together related facts. So that will alter what it means to be a reporter in the future. I don't think your jobs uh, have to be in depth jeopardy, but if you have unscrupulous employers who just want to get out information and they aren't truly involved in educating the public, yes, some of you will lose your jobs. Um, which brings me to the point uh, of scruples, uh, which you know marries with ethics and values. And um, my assumption is in the news media, um, the unscrupulous, at least in the current environment, outnumber the scrupulous uh, because not necessary for a value decision, but because that is where the business is. Now, you spoke about the negotiating freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and, and how that plays out in um, an AI world. With algorithms determining what information gets out there, how widely it's shared, and social media platforms becoming so powerful. And there's several countries where one hears people get their news from their social media feeds rather than news uh, platforms directly. What stage is this technology at? And has there already been, I mean, are you aware, has there already been this thought? Has this entire idea been inserted into these large tech giants of what the ethics of information sharing are. Are they going to be included in the algorithms that are written? Are people like you, you know, lobbying for that? Are you actually advocating for that? Where are we in that space? And what are the challenges in that zone? So there is good news and bad news on this front. The good news is there's actually a tremendous amount of attention being given to ethics. We have all these ethical guidelines and principles. Uh, some of them have been in, 
endorsed widely, such as those that were put forward by the OECD or by by UNICEF. Uh, we had even the Beijing principles coming out of China. So AI principles, which are largely broad in scope, have given a lot of attention. Among the researchers themselves, concerns particularly around super intelligence and that they don't invent technology that will lead to human extermination, um, have, have taken up the long demanded cudgel that they look at the ethical ramifications of technologies they're developing. It was really only a decade or two ago if you asked an, a genomicist whether they were concerned about the ways in which their technology might be adopted, they said, that's not my problem, that's the politician's problem. Uh, scientists now are, if not universally, at least many, much of the leadership is taking on board concern around what technologies they develop and whether they get deployed ethically. Now, in areas such as social media, little did those who created social media, including Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook and perhaps, and clearly the most successful of the social media purveyors, little did they know when they were creating social media that their social media could be used by unscrupulous actors to destroy democracy a big concern in the US, in the UK, whether the Brexit vote was manipulated and certainly should be a, a, a big concern for, for India. We uh, will find out within the next 60 days how effectively that manipulation has been in, in America that combined together with the COVID crisis. There are real attempts to, to, to um, disseminate not only um, inaccuracies and slanderous comments about uh, candidates, particularly the Democratic candidate by the Russians and by others who are engaged in this activity. But unlike 2016, when the social media platforms had very little idea this was going on, unfortunately, they probably had more idea than they, they are willing to admit. And they certainly were not willing to take much effort to mitigate them, they now understand that they are likely to be regulated and perhaps even broken up if they don't take some mitigation efforts and therefore they are doing so. So, so you hear Facebook say it won't take political ads, it's monitoring, um, it's monitoring the manipulation of the social media. Twitter has been even more more aggressive in limiting what can be put on Twitter. They are trying to monitor fake, fake information being disseminated widely or, or accounts that are actually being created by and manipulated at a distance by governments who want to, um, who want to influence the election. So we are seeing a great deal of effort to make these platforms more ethical. Um, one of the very heartening things for me is that there's been the recognition that facial, uh, there's, well, I'm going from recognition to recognition, but facial recognition software um, is clearly uh, a technology that does not that comes up with many false positives and could be truly used to repress freedom of expression. And therefore there are many of the corporations, Microsoft and Google and others that are um, demanding not only that ethical standards be in put place, but they will not allow their technology to be used in, in police operation, their facial recognition software to be loose police operation. But in the midst of all this, what I'll say is relatively good news, there's the bad news that in some cases, corporations and other deployers of technology, they're more concerned with ethics washing. Ethics washing, what is that? What we call ethics washing. They're more concerned with looking as if they are ethical than actually taking up the full cudgel of being ethical. 
So I these see. are, in many cases, public corporations. They have a fiduciary responsibility to their stockholders. And uh, often they take that more seriously than their responsibility to be good citizens. No. So we are monitoring whether or not we are truly going to get ethical behavior out of the IT oligopoly and, uh, and lesser entities, or whether there will be a great deal of ethics washing, which allows these inordinately powerful entities, often more powerful than anyone except for the largest governments in the world, whether, whether they really act in a responsible way or the next generation of oligarchs really is only concerned with its own power. And that's all entangled with this pressure toward authoritarianism that we're seeing in many of the democratic countries around the world. Right, so now let me come to a little more of a practical um, possibly problem. And um, since you have been studying the subject for such a long time, probably amongst the foremost experts in the world on this, uh, the two questions, one is the ethical value systems or the ethics that AI is, is resting on, the, the basic architecture, has that already been baked in and we are now just adding to it and we can't go back and change that basic architecture. I don't know whether it was uh, in the same conference where I met you, which uh, you know spoke about how very large corporations in the, in the West, uh, the resumes that come in for jobs, about 70% of them are sifted through by AI and only 30% see human eyes for some of the very large corporations. And because those AIs are designed by men, they found that a disproportionately large amount of resumes with the same, uh, with, with the same uh, you know, accomplishments were being rejected purely because they had you know, names that weren't the names that the AI had been given to learn from. So is AI building on already flawed structures that have already been baked into the cake or can we reverse and start afresh? That is my first question. And my second question is that, are there enough experts uh, such as yourself for all large corporations to actually consult and see how they make artificial intelligence or machine learning more ethical? Because even if they want to, is there the HR in place for, to help them do that? Great questions. So there are, there are many layers to this question. I mean, first of all, consider the internet. Uh, the internet was designed in a way that decentralized it. And that decentralization um, really facilitated its growth and the fact that we find it so useful. The problem is, that the very nature of the way the internet was, des was designed makes privacy and security a nightmare and almost impossible to, to realize. So we are actually going to have to totally redesign the internet and replace the existing internet with a new internet if we're going to eliminate it. Wow. Okay. And uh, efforts are being made in that direction, but to really replace a technology that is now so ubiquitous with a different form, uh, that is quite a challenge. And yet efforts are going on on that, on that front, including efforts by the very creators of the internet itself. So that's an example of where um, there's an inherent immoral design or at least an inherent design which opens up, us up to bad actors. The other area you refer to is what we, re what we call algorithmic bias. So there was so much excitement in the last five to five years or so around the explosion of interest in machine learning algorithms. Machine learning algorithms are algorithms that are capable of looking at massive amounts of data and discovering new relationships that require our attention or that might actually facilitate significant productivity. 
But what was realized soon after this fascination with machine learning algorithms, which really put artificial intelligence on a fast track. When I say a fast track, there are many areas in artificial intelligence, such as common sense reasoning, semantic understanding. We're a long ways from solving those. But it made artificial intelligence really a productive uh, approach of research. And all, but all of these machine learning algorithms are dependent upon the data that's fed into them and the data that's fed into them is historically accumulated data. And as you rightly noted, much of this data has biases built into it. They are, they are racial biases, they are, they are um, credo biases, they are gender biases. And even when you try and expunge these biases, for example, you say that the algorithm cannot look at gender, well, it can often deduce gender. In America, you can often deduce race by just what, what um, zip code, what area one lives in. So these biases get get processed regardless of whether your intention is to eliminate them. Now that said, there are moves to try and create unbiased training data to, to flag the actual biases that exist within the input data and therefore data analytics that looks at the biases that may also be in the output data. So there's a lot of work going on on that level um, with a moderate degree of success. I would say bias can't be eliminated totally and there may even be situations in which you don't want it eliminated totally. Now on to the third area that you bring up, which I think is the most important. Do we have enough people working on this? The exciting thing is that we have anybody working on it at all. <laughs> I mean, these, <laughs> these, for me, um, I mean, I'm, I'm now kind of the elderly gadfly who has been raising these issues for decades now. And it's so exciting for me to see that there are thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of particularly young people who are looking for occupations in these areas. And there's actually the creation of many jobs within academia and research centers, and even within the corporations themselves for people to work on, on the ethics of emerging technologies and particularly AI ethics. Now, is it enough? No. Uh, will adequate jobs be created? No. Are there enough experts to fulfill all the, the, the needs we have? Far from it. The good news for many of the younger people listening, and that means this is a growth area for you. It's a growth area presuming that jobs are created, but it's definitely a growth area given the needs. Unfortunately, it's hard as a young person to fully fulfill the kinds of demands we have. You can find your own little ecological niche within the AI ethics or the emerging technology ethics environment. But we also need transdisciplinary scholars. And that takes time, that takes exposure, that takes engagement to feel comfortable moving from field to field and to appreciate that what you, an action you take in one area may act, may reverberate throughout our society and have impacts that you are unaware of in other areas. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's come to the flexibility of this. Uh, like on the one hand, you've said that it is baked in and the, uh, the need to reimagine it from the bottom up is important, but you're not sure how practical uh, or possible that will be. Now, what we have seen since the digital age that certain debates that were settled, values that were considered done and closed uh, are being reopened. You know, whether it is the comment of their fine people on both sides, where one side was chanting, they will not replace us. Uh, clear outright racism is not outrightly wrong anymore. Um, things, and, and in India, we have so many more cases. There are people, you know, in power. It is, outright, it is outrightly wrong. 
Right. But unfortunately, we are getting increasingly powerful political groups that are are trying to dismiss, override that wrong, or proposing that the world is moving into a direction where fighting for, let's say, white superiority in America is seen as fundamental to survival as opposed to inculcating cooperation and eliminating racism. Absolutely. So, I mean, as far as you and I are concerned, I guess we're on the same page on the moral spectrum and the value system. But even in, you know, India, there have been cases of political leaders saying things that are outright bigoted, and that has become acceptable socially. Now, clearly, we have entered a, a, an age where uh, things that were considered wrong by at least a large chunk of people, large enough for it to be considered a universal wrong, have to push back against a people who say, no, this is an accept, bigotry is acceptable. It's an acceptable political ideology. Is AI that flexible? Can we change it around as quickly if we were to correct these, these moral quandaries that have gone into zones of bigotry and outright prejudice? And if we were to correct that politically, can technology be corrected as swiftly? Well, let me take the ethical part of, of, of your point first and speak to that. And then we'll talk about um, how we can um, bring the digital tools into reflecting that. First of all, it's important to know that while we might have had the illusion that racism was eliminated or class biases were eliminated, that's never been the case. I lived in India in the 1970s for the better part of two years. And uh, the, uh, the treatment of untouchables was horrible. Uh, and it was only because the untouchables created their own political party and that, that, and that you became an actual country that had two parties. And in those days, the Congress party won every election until Indira Gandhi lost her first election to what is, was the original Janata party, a bit party. different than, than it has evolved in the, in the modern day. But, uh. So the battle for equality, for mutual respect, to eliminate racism, to defuse the impact of, of class conflict, because there is class conflict, uh, that is ongoing. That has been a, a multi-thousand year struggle that was ramped up with the birth of democracy and that the birth of democracy as it enfolded into expanding the right to vote from property owners to, to include women and eventually everyone. That, uh, that has been a long struggle and it has had setbacks and the illusion that it has ever been over is purely naive. So every generation, has to reinvigorate these values and has to fight for them. So what we are dealing with now is a slightly different expression of in the challenge of those values. Now, all of us have to make a decision about whether the world we are creating is one that is fundamentally stable or it's a world that can come apart at the seams. And I think the most intolerant elements generally think it's coming apart at the seams and therefore they have to fight for the rights of their group. Where others of us make a more ethical, but perhaps more dangerous decision. And our dangerous decision is that the only future lies in cooperation. And therefore, we are going to act as if cooperation can be fulfilled, even if it's not necessarily clear that we can guarantee that in a world that has 
um, artificial systems where some people control that sy those systems and have more and more power. Now, can artificial intelligence, or can the technologies we have created, can they reflect that? Well, in many ways, these technologies are only as good as the actors that develop them and the actors who deploy them. So again, in this age, our struggle lies in putting in place governance mechanisms, reinvigorating values, challenging in the courts, those who are bad actors. Right. Uh, we have some questions coming in. I, I have so many more, but clearly we don't have time for all my questions. So um, uh, we have three questions from the audience and we have, I think, about 10 minutes or 12. <clears throat> so just ration accordingly your time to each. The first one is from Paras. Uh, Paras asks, can artificial intelligence in journalism a as an anchor or reporter be made biased to a political party like in the present? As I have seen that they can learn by themselves due to machine learning, what if they are only made to see hate or fake history? Will these things change the ideology or the type of news they would present to the people? Like now the people in India have changed a bit since the last few years due to the media bias and hate news and false history being narrated. Will, is it possible that news related AI will internalize these hate machines? It already is. It already is. And again, it becomes the intentions of those who look at this data or what they are exposed to. And that's what we're seeing with, with social media, is you can be exposed to just fake news. And that fake news can be amplified over and over again. So that requires great diligence on the part of those who, who are reporters that uh, to understand, to be super diligent in being sure that they are getting input from all sides of an issue and that the input they are getting is not inherently distorted. So it's not enough to look at what's coming in your news feed. You need to find the good faith brokers, you need to find the honest academics and the, the uh, thorough politicians, and you need to be checking out with them whether they have input that might um, be radically different from those you are being exposed to through digital media. Right, thanks. Uh, this question is from Soumya. Soumya says, should philosophy, politics, and social sciences be mandatory subjects with appropriate pedagogy in primary and secondary schools, uh, much like basic physics, chemistry, and biology is today? Well, there was a time in which the social sciences and the humanities dominated <laughs> education. And there's a very famous speech that was being um, called the two culture speech that was being given in the early 1950s saying we have to reorient our education toward the sciences. Now we have done that, but that does not mean people necessarily have or students are getting inadequate taste of what they need to understand to appreciate what the application of the sciences in terms of technologies being deployed will do to culture. So yes, by all means, this needs to be part uh, of education. The difficulty is we're also in a world where there's so much to teach students. What do you teach them and what don't you teach them? But I would say, um, um, yes, certainly we need to be thinking through what will be 21st century education. How are students going to come out with not only an understanding of sciences, but the ability to discriminate whether what they are seeing is good science, bad science, whether the evaluation of the science, the technologies that are being deployed is realistic or, or merely hype whether it's being used for destructive purposes or whether it is truly enhancing the overall quality of life. Right, uh, now this question says, uh, has the time come to go beyond or reimagine democracy itself and governance into a system that reconfigures the relationships between citizens and nation states and global citizenships? And if I may just add to that, um, the Congress that you're talking about, um, what kind of influence do you think it can have on governments across the world to seriously have a department or a regulatory framework 
where AI ethics is inherent in that democratic setup? Well, whether the Congress will have much influence or not is hard to say. I mean, I'm just um, trying to get us to sow seeds that we move in the right direction. But there are forces such as this present COVID crisis beyond our control that alter the alter history in ways that we cannot fully perceive. Nevertheless, I'm among those who feel you make your good faith effort. Now, part of what I think we do need is 21st century governance. And in some areas that implies a radical, a radical restructuring of the social contract, the agreement between governments and its citizens in terms of what its goals and intents should be, and probably has ramifications for the political economies that we depend upon in the future. So the nature of capitalism in America is such that an inordinate amount of the wealth of productivity goes to the owners of capital. And that means that the top 1% owns most of productivity and the more and more jobs that they automate with robots and algorithms and so forth, the more and more that productivity gains go to the owners of capital and don't go toward wages. So that's something we have to fundamentally reform. Um, it can be reformed, but uh, do we have the will to do so? And again, consider if jobs really do disappear, how do we ensure that those who have depended upon wages in the past get goods and services? Some of us have talked about the need for a guaranteed income. I think that a guaranteed income is a good idea, but I don't think it necessarily is for free. A guaranteed income may be based upon you are doing something that is an overall contribution to your society, but you make the decision as to what is that contribution, not some external group. And that could lead to a proliferation of creativity, of ingenuity, of new projects for education, of new ways of communicating, of, of, of media that uh, perhaps do not have millions of readers, but have 10,000 readers who, uh, who care about getting local news again. So many things are possible. This is all by way of saying that we are in an inflection point in history. There's need for radical reform. And if we don't get radical reform, I'm afraid we're, we are entering into a delegitimation crisis, which is a crisis where we citizens no longer have faith in our government's ability to guide our societies. And if that's the case, you get revolution in one form or another. Unfortunately, revolutions often empower, often empower the worst among us and not the best. Okay, um, that's, that's a little alarming, uh, but yes, I, I see where you're coming from. And now you are uh, associated with, uh, you know, one of the finest uh, top universities in the world. Uh, and you, I'm sure, move around in academic circles. Is this subject, the ethics of machines, is it popular enough? Do you see an entire generation of ethicists who are interested in the ethics of AI being churned out? Because at least here, until I heard your talk, I mean, I had heard of this as a concept, but I hadn't ever met anybody. Uh, and I was so glad that I met you, who's you know one of the finest in the world, who was really talking about this, who was advocating this as a thing? Uh, is there enough interest in the you know millennials or Gen Z that you see there will be enough evangelists of this philosophy, if I may call it that, to go out and take it to the world in the next 50, 70 years? Well, I mean, thank you for your kind words. Um, I can just tell you a little bit of my history where there was a few dozen of us talking about this 20 years ago. 
And now in Europe and America, there are thousands, perhaps even tens of thousands of people who are giving these issues a concern. Um, I've been going back and forth to China quite often until seven months ago, <laughs> when I suddenly decided I discovered I wasn't going anywhere. Um, and I see that uh, we are we have catalyzed the development of an AI ethics community in China. How significant it will be, I don't know, but it has um, some leading figures who are promulgating the, the movement forward. And China has its Beijing principles, and just two days ago it released its, its guidelines for AI and children. So if there's not much of this going on in India, I hope that uh, I hope that you and those listening in will take it upon themselves to begin putting in place an ethics of emerging technology curriculum, a focus on ethical issues in the deployment of new technologies within your media, um, uh, political movements to underscore the use of, of biased algorithms and other technologies that un are unsafe, concerns around social media and how it's manipulating attitudes and behavior by putting people in silos where they don't hear many different points of view. So it's incumbent upon those of you listening in to take on the cudgel of the 21st century. Seems to me this is the challenge. This chat, we have to though move in a way of care and sensitivity. Um, ethics can't trump people's survival. So we are in a very difficult time when on the one hand, you need to fight a COVID crisis. You may put, need to put in tracking software to, to fight the, uh, the spread of the virus. Uh, pretty hard to track it when you have the explosion that you're seeing in India right now, the tragic explo explosion of COVID cases. <coughs> Excuse me, but hopefully you can level the curve. But if you're going to put in tracking software to know who's, who's encountered who that is infected, then you also have to put in place some mitigating measures to ensure that it doesn't take India toward a surveillance society. So I am seeing um, an exponential growth in the subject area. And again, there were a few of us who are a catalyst, who were catalysts for this decades ago in North America and in Europe. So it only takes a few of you to lay seeds and to take the take this burden upon your own shoulders to be the enlightening forces for the next generation. Well, that's a wonderfully optimistic thought to end on. And I would like to um, urge all those watching, whether you're news professionals, academics, legal experts, policy experts, um, you know, what Wendell has said is, is extremely important. And from the first time I heard him, I realized the importance of this and we would have loved to have you here, Wendell. Uh, but I am 100% sure that we will get you here when this COVID is behind us because there is so much more, I think, an audience with live engagement can, can uh, learn from you. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Well, there are other groups in India. There's the Observer Research Foundation. There are many others that are already taking up this subject. So I'm... Um, I'm very hopeful that you can create a critical mass and also see an explosion of interest in the ethics of emerging technologies. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for watching. Over to you, Suraj.